Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Internet. Good day, Tristan. Hello. How's Welcome it going? Very well. Very well. We've, we're hanging on to our last couple of days of sunshine here in Vancouver before it's gray until May. Oh, we we have your gray in Los Angeles today. It, it's been sunny most of the week, but we we got a little gray today, so we must have taken it. And we're happy to share. Yeah. <laughs> we'll share as much as we possibly can. Our pleasure. Our pleasure to do it. Seasonal affective disorder started here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Aww. laughs> it used to be VAD, Vancouver affectiveness. <laughs> uh, all right. Shall we do the show? Let's do it. Here we go in three, two. This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to every single one of you, including John and Becky Johnston, Chris Benito, Steve Iadarola, and our brand new patron, Keith. Woo, welcome, Keith. On this episode of DTNS, Microsoft wanted Apple to buy Bing, kind of. How to keep your website from being used to train AI, and the countries who stand to gain the most from people using those AI tools. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 29th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Sushi, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, the producer and co-host at Momentous TV and AI Named the Show, Tristan Jutra. Welcome. Happy to be back. It's good to have you. How's the, how's the new show going? Uh, aside from its impact on my sleep schedule, um, <laughs> well, well, we are, are you we... doing it in the middle of the night? <laughs> Is Is it, that... Isn't that always the way? Like it's going well, and I haven't slept. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Just episode <laughs> six just dropped today. Our AI clones coming for your job. Ah, find out on AI Name the Show. Meanwhile, right here, we shall start with the quick hits. The Wall Street Journal sources say Chinese officials told Apple that it must strictly implement rules to ban unregistered foreign apps, with sources citing recent meetings between officials and Apple staff. China restricting the apps would prevent Chinese iPhone users from downloading some Western social media apps like Instagram, X, Facebook, YouTube, and WhatsApp. You don't often hear of China easing restrictions on the Internet, do you? But the Cyberspace Administration of China has proposed loosening cross-border data security controls in order to ease the concerns of foreign businesses. These are the rules that govern how companies are allowed to move customer data between countries. So in this case, between China and data centers outside of China. The proposal would no longer require specific consent to move data that doesn't contain personal or other important info. Now, how important data is defined is going to be important. Right now, it's still a little vague, but it is expected to be defined in the final version. France's competition authority raided NVIDIA's local offices this week due to supposedly suspecting that the company is engaging in anti-competitive practices. Now, the regulator uh, elaborated, uh, did not uh, elaborate on which practices it was specifically investigating or even which company it had targeted, NVIDIA or something else, beyond that it was in the graphics card sector. The Wall Street Journal sources say that the operation had indeed tar uh, targeted NVIDIA, the world's largest maker of graphics and AI chips. U.S. Supreme Court announced Friday it will hear two cases about laws in Florida and Texas uh, that would restrict how companies moderate content on social media platforms. We've talked about these before on DTNS. It's been a while, though, because they've been working their way through the system. The two laws would prevent companies from demoting or removing content from their platforms on the basis of viewpoint. It would also require transparency in moderation rules and require companies to stick to those rules. There's a few differences between the Florida version and the Texas version, but that's the overall gist of both of them. Both laws have been prevented from going into effect while the legal challenges have worked their way through the courts, and the Supreme Court will hear arguments on the cases likely sometime next year. few of us this morning might have heard friends of ours 
who used Discord saying, is something wrong with Discord? <laughs> By the time I woke up, it uh, apparently was, uh, it had, had been put to rest, but... Uh, kind of a big deal. Discord messaging platform used by gamers, live streamers, general chatters, uh, people who do things uh, like what we do on DTNS, appeared to be down early Friday for many users. In a statement, the company said, as an explanation, we're experiencing unusual traffic spikes that lead to users being temporarily blocked, and we're working on mitigate mitigating that issue. The issues appear at least at this point, to be related to Cloudflare, which was having problems with its dashboard and API service and is undergoing scheduled maintenance. More fun facts keep pouring out of the U.S. FTC's antitrust case against Google. Microsoft Business Development Vice President John Tinter testified Thursday that Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella met with Apple CEO Tim Cook in 2016 to discuss investing billions, multi-billions of dollars in a deal to replace Google as the search engine on iOS. Bing, at the time, powered Siri and Spotlight searches. Uh, it did that between 2013 and 2017. But Microsoft at the time wanted to expand that to Safari, where Google was still used, and beyond. In 2018, after their deal had expired and Google was now on everything, uh, Apple and Microsoft met again to discuss a search deal outside the United States. Well, you don't want us in the U.S. How about if we do it elsewhere? Microsoft was also apparently talking to Samsung about making Bing the default on its platforms. And Bloomberg sources, this wasn't part of the, the open court uh, testimony, but Bloomberg sources report that in 2020, Microsoft pitched Eddie Q at Apple on the idea of selling Bing to Apple. And that's the thing making all the big headlines today. Apple apparently never took any of these deals, uh, mostly using Bing's existence as a bargaining chip to get more money out of Google. Samsung never seriously entertained the ideas and apparently through back channels politely asked <laughs> Microsoft to stop pitching them, saying that their their president uh, to pro tem was was too polite to tell them to stop. Uh, and Samsung did that because they didn't want to threaten their much larger relationship with Google, which involved all of Android, not just search. So the big headline here is Microsoft pitching the idea of selling Bing. That clearly never was serious. Uh, I don't know. Tristan, should any of this matter to any of us as consumers? Well, it's interesting. In some of the classes I taught in a past life about things like social media and search engine optimization, I would often ask people, it's like, why do you think when you open up your iPhone, for example, and you go to search that it goes to Google? And how, how did that arrangement happen? Or when you, in that period that you mentioned, when you're asking Siri uh, a question and it goes to show you web search results sometimes, or we, we asked to uh, search, it would give you Bing results. And a lot of regular folks had never really thought about that. And so he said, you know, it's pay to play. And estimates for that time period for Google anyhow have ranged anywhere from 8 billion to 18 billion dollars. It's never actually been disclosed, but you know, that's a lot of money that, you know, Apple is not that interested in letting go, you know, due to a regulatory interference. But then the whole notion of being trying to sell itself to uh, Apple, Microsoft divesting of that, which kind of runs contrary to Apple's, uh, you know, build it here, you know, not invented here syndrome. They do largely smaller acquisitions. For example, 21 AI companies in the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, you know, Beats, I think it was, was their biggest uh, acquisition in like a long, long time. So to go and buy something like Bing from Microsoft would be kind of out of character. Furthermore, people have noticed over the last couple of years an Apple bot actually crawling people's websites as well leading to speculation that maybe Apple was cr creating and designing their own search engine in-house, which would be a pretty heavy lift to try to make something competitive with Google, which has become so entrenched over the last couple of decades. Perhaps this Apple bot was using to train their large language model, mm -hmm. which again is rumored to make maybe someday make Siri smart finally. Well, you know, <laughs> I were, you know, hearkening back, to 2023 i remember you know siri was the first uh you know ai powered uh, assistant um that i was using and i remember being in the car 
and, you know, trying to just like more or less, you know, make her say something crazy, you know, like, oh, well, let's figure out how to make the, you know, the, the, the bot not say the thing that you want to say. And that's how we know that humans are still, you know, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> in power. But it was a Bing thing. I had kind of forgotten about that. You know, that was 10 years ago. And it was Bing powered search uh, for Siri in the early days. And that was at the time where a lot of us were kind of like, this is cool, potentially. Doesn't work that well, but like yep. potentially pretty cool. So I can see where the two companies would have would have had many conversations over the years to be like, okay, how do we make this better? How, you know, how, how does this, uh, the, this you know, partnership make sense? And I guess it didn't. The conventional wisdom in all the stories I read today was that Apple was playing along Microsoft in order to drive up the price with Google. They were happy to have mm. Bing around because it meant they could ask Google for more because they had a way to walk out of the deals. Uh, my theory on Microsoft having a low level exec or lower level exec, right? We're not talking Satya Nadella at this point where somebody else coming in the room and saying, Hey, would you want to buy Bing? I feel like they didn't expect that Apple would want to buy Bing. They didn't really want to sell Bing, but they figured that might be the only way to get their attention uh, and maybe get into a room with Tim Cook again. Cause it feels like at that point, Apple had just said, you know what? Sorry, we, we just, we just don't want to buy your thing. It's similar to Samsung having to have uh, employees through a back channel say, you know, our boss is really tired of you asking about Bing. It's just not going to happen. Can you stop? So when they're discussing pay for uh, pay to play uh, with Eddie Q and then they go, Hey, maybe you just want to buy us. And Eddie's like, I got to talk to my manager. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's what they were hoping. And that, that, that Tim, Tim, he would then pull Tim Cook out of his office. Maybe. I don't know. That's just, that's just my conspiracy theory. I got to admit, I've been trying to use DuckDuckGo for the last mm -hmm. few years and it's powered by Bing with some extra zhuzh on top. And I still find myself going to, to Google, uh, you know, quite, quite often because it's Bing, uh, it's different, but it's still not quite there for certain things. And then of course, mm -hmm. a lot of us are using the, you know, being chat i think that was the the genius move with all of this because one of the you know theories that people have as well is that maybe microsoft didn't want to pay the kind of money that google was paying for the exclusive uh default for the safari browser on ios and 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 even hang on to the siri default either because they could use that money for other things maybe mm -hmm. redirecting it to open AI, for example, they save their pennies. So they yeah. get their $11 billion into open AI so far. So maybe that's, that was the smarter play because so much more interest in Bing, you know, since early this year, um, after the partnership and they've been rolling the GPT, uh, functionality into Bing chat. I know I've been using it a lot more since then. Yeah. Well, no, that's a of, that's smart thought. Speaking of AI, London's Capital Economics issued an assessment of which countries will benefit the most from new technologies marketed as AI. The study looked at countries' potential for innovation, use of AI, adaptability to its effects. The U.S. topped the chart, followed by Singapore, followed by the U.K. All three countries have successfully attracted top talent in the field and have favorable business policies. The UK in particular benefits from its higher education system. Google's DeepMind, based in London. Switzerland, ranked fourth. Sweden, ranked fifth. The two countries ranked first and second in the world in adaptability with a good track record of redeploying resources in the face of new technologies. China ranked relatively low because of regulatory barriers and government intervention in the private sector. We kind of talked about that a little bit earlier in the show, but yeah, what do we think about this? Tristan, you're covering this beat uh, regularly. <laughs> sure, yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry we don't have the rank of Canada on here. It just wasn't in the story we looked at. Uh, I, so, I know. Well, Where the heck is Canada? So do you think it's a coincidence that three of the top five that are in Europe, but two of which aren't part of the EU and mm. none of which are part of the Eurozone. 
Uh, mm. That was one of the conclusions of the report is that a lot of Europe lacks the cloud infrastructure needed uh, for AI processing and therefore has to go elsewhere uh, to, to do that. Uh, the financial backing isn't isn't there everywhere. It's there in the UK. It's there in Switzerland, but it's not in other places. Uh, and, and most of all, the regulatory rules there are very strict in Europe. Uh, so so that's a good question, Tristan, which is the the European Union proper has done a lot of work to protect jobs, protect privacy uh, ahead of the implementation of AI. But the implication of this report is that in doing so, it has reduced the competitiveness of AI within Europe. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, I'm from Canada, so, you know, we love us some regulation up here. But when I see the stuff that you're, the EU has been doing over the last number of years, it makes me feel like Peter Thiel, like, it's like a screaming libertarian. Oh, gosh. So, sorry, I, for we're, that. All, we're all, we're all seasteading now, apparently. So, the, when you see the kinds of moves that the EU has been making, well, in, you know, we have the Today story about NVIDIA, or sorry, in France part of the EU, being aggressive mm -hmm. against NVIDIA, being aggressive against, you know, Act, uh, Activision Blizzard acquisitions, uh, being aggressive against Apple with the whole USB th uh, USB-C thing that they were going to get to anyway, like it was on most of their other devices. It's just this one after another after another. And you can't help but think that that's eventually going to maybe create a bit of a hostile or at least a chilly climate for investment because one of the other stories that's wrapped up with this is the is is recruitment and if you have lack of funding because of concerns about overregulation then it's going to be hard to recruit and then if it's hard to recruit it's going to be hard to get funding so you get this vicious cycle where they're creating this not super venture capital friendly environment for tech and Europe it's Europe's got to do something, right, to get going again. And we've we've got these, you know, UK, Switzerland, and Sweden, which are kind of, you know, they're they're Europe, but they're kind of not Europe, each in their own their own way. And so they're not sub. At least UK and Switzerland don't buy into a lot of the yeah. regulation from the super government, the, the EU Parliament. Which you know, it's like they just red tape. A I mean, I know Switzerland doesn't, but Sweden does not as well. Sweden is part of the EU, but they're not part of the Eurozone. So they don't use Got it. the, uh, they're not currently using the Euro yet. And so there's a number of things that would be associated with that. So they probably have a little more wiggle room Understood. than those that are like fully bought in. And of course, you know, the, yeah. the Swiss still on the, the Swiss franc, UK is on the pound and they're not part of the EU anyway, either of them. Yeah, they, and yeah. this is one situation where the UK leaving the European Union has has freed them up a little bit and, and provided a, a positive in that uh, they it may be harder for them to collaborate across the channel uh, with European institutions. That's one of the downsides, but it's got yeah. some flexibility uh, that seems to be at least in the estimation of London's capital economics, which granted is in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, in their estimation, it, it gives the UK a, a potential advantage here. But at the same time, the things that the EU are doing, like privacy is a good thing, right? You know, yeah. prom promoting competition is a good thing, you know, cracking down on anti-competitive practices. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. is generally a bit more liberal when it comes to these uh, these issues. You know, the FTC's latest adventures of the last couple of years, not notwithstanding. But, um, you know, it's all these things happen. There's a reason why the U.S. attracts so much money and so much talent and generates so much innovation. And we're not seeing quite as much of that out of places like the EU. And not to pick on, on Europe, that that's one of the reasons they dinged China uh, on, on on this as well, was, was the heavy regulatory practices yeah. and the uncertainty of, well, if I start a business there, am I going to be able to keep that business there? I have to partner for things like data storage within uh, the country, which is why that, that loosening of data transfers earlier, I think, uh, was, was fairly significant. It's China's the first indication recently that China's recognizing that this is really a break on foreign companies coming in and that's hurting their economy. Yeah, and the EU is looking at China and thinking, life goals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that, if, if it's a, that intense or not, uh, but maybe, maybe it is. Yeah.
Uh, well, folks, uh, we do a lot of other stuff uh, on our channels. Uh, the patrons get a lot of, of cool shows. If you've been enjoying uh, free preview week, you know that. Uh, one thing that's available to everybody, not, not restricted to patrons, is Tom's Top 5. It's a show I do on our YouTube channel where I break down five things to know, usually about technology. Sometimes I stray outside of technology and have a little fun. This week's episode is the Top 5 Greatest Video Game Characters of All time if you want to know what made the list well you got to find out by going to youtube.com slash daily tech news show will google announce support for an extended flag in websites robot.txt file you know it you love it the let's it exclude its site's public data from being used to train google's ai models tom what's up yeah, so if you don't know uh, or love yet the robots.txt file, it's a file that sits in the root directory of a website. So it's there, the first the first directory that a web crawler that's going around the internet looking at everything that's on the internet uh, will see. It is most often used to tell those crawlers what parts of a site it can index and what it can. There might be a lot of reasons where a site says, we for search engine optimization or or even just for you know limited uh, privacy reasons we don't want this part of our site to show up in a search engine so they'll put an entry in robots.txt that says hey googlebot which is the name of of, of the uh, crawler uh, don't access anything below the homepage let's say google has now added support for a token called google dash extended so in your little txt file you can put instructions for Google Extended. And when a website includes that, it restricts the use of data collected by the web crawler from being used in AI training without restricting it from being indexed for search. Before, it was kind of either or. If you wanted to restrict it from training, you had to restrict it from search. Now you don't have to. Uh, OpenAI provides a similar option. Uh, Tristan, what do you think of this move? Well, I think... <laughs> It's good to give people options and opt out is great. Some people are going, well, why not make it opt in? And mm. because if they did, you know, defaults matter, right? So if they did, they would barely have anything to train on because most people would just not get around to even people in. who wanted to do it wouldn't bother exactly. to go put it in. Oh, exactly. There, right? yeah, yeah, now, exactly. I have to admit, I have a strange affection for robots.txt files, again, from my <laughs> SEO days and SEO instructing days, because it's this weird little text file that a lot of people don't even realize exists. And you can go- Well, and, your... and like, just explain, like why is it, you know, something that is so prevalent today? Well, if you can go to any regular, uh, any of one of your favorite websites and after the domain name slash robots.txt, and you can have a look what they've got in there. And it's actually very telling what search engines, or sorry, what, which, what, what websites would like the search engines to a crawl mm. and B index, which are two different things. And from a search engine optimization point of view, there are certain things that you don't want the uh, search engines to index because it can actually muddy your SEO profile. If you want to be known for certain things only and ranks very well for certain things, then it's actually in your, in your interests to block certain pages from the search engines so so the search engines have a clear idea of what your site is about and what you know the, the clusters of pages are about so it's actually really interesting to take a look say if you go to apple.com robots.txt you can see instructions not only to the google bot but various other spiders and or crawlers and see what they were are actually blocking off a lot of their e-commerce pages for example they they don't want those pages cached for one things because they may show obsolete pricing. So a lot of websites will do that for promo pages, landing pages, splash pages, things like that. So that potentially obsolete content doesn't show up in search results. And that's, I've actually found deals that way doing, going through a search, but then you get to the deals page and realize it's expired. So that's not necessarily a great look for websites either, but you can also see the kinds of things that Apple, for example, is blocking from some of the Chinese search engines. Mm -hmm. I was just in noticing that because I'm looking at that since you mentioned it. Including yeah. product red. 
And because Apple doesn't have product red in China and red means something different in China mm -hmm. than it does for product red globally for the fundraising to, you know, to combat HIV around the world and particularly Africa. That's not something that China is not uh, that is necessarily on board for, right? So they may have red Apple products in China, but they're not product red. So this is whole um, sort of curating of the, the the visible web pages for not only the search engines but the search engine results, what people are actually going to see. And then the, just very quickly, the difference between the crawling and indexing is that. Allowing them to crawl lets them the, the the spiders or the bots follow the various links through your site to go through the entire hierarchy and get an idea of the topography of your website, and you can prevent that. But you can also um, alternatively ask for certain pages not to be indexed. They can be crawled, like all the links can be followed, but not necessarily indexed. And when they're not indexed, the snippets won't show up in the search engines, and they the pages won't be cached as well. So there's different reasons to choose one or the other. Or both. Yeah. The robots TXT on the DTNS site just says, uh, don't index or crawl our admin section. Thanks. Everything else is fine. <laughs> One one uh, post secondary institution I was working for, um, they they were blocking a uh, crawling of uh, a folder called Fluffy Bunnies. It's like, what is in the Fluffy Bunnies folder? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, one one wonders. The uh, Google, another, uh, ask, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I was just going to say, you know, on the subject of this, Google also announced a few new features on its search experience, SJE, including large language model features in Google search, now available to ages 13 through 17, if you're a human in the U.S., previously restricted from those accounts. They'll still add a way to add it through search labs, and the company says it's also adding in stronger protections for outputs related to illegal or age-gated substances or bullying. Google is also adding an about this result note to AI-generated responses from SGE. It will give more context about how the response was generated. And Google also updating its model to detect false or offensive premise queries and respond with more accurate responses as a result. It's also working on using LLMs to analyze its own first draft responses and rewrite them for higher quality and safety. Starting to seem like Google and other AI tool makers are kind of worried about safety because that's what happens when you're big enough. Is that good, Tristan? What I want to know is when they're going to uh, open it up to 52-year-old Canadians because we still can't access Because <laughs> you can't of, get it in Canada yet. No, yeah. no Google Bar, none of this stuff. So that's why <laughs> we're Team like, Bing here in Canada. Let me add it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I guess the question is, is how effective will this be? Or will this just you know, be a challenge for enterprising teenagers to get into these uh, you know, tools regardless of the age? I mean, how many... How many kids do you know that got onto Instagram or Facebook before they were 13? It's really not that complicated. They've always got a friend that can get them in, what what have you. Now, I think it is key that they are trying to dissuade the uh, AI from responding to prompts regarding uh, bullying or the, uh, mm -hmm. the 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 consumption or use of either illegal su substances or age restricted substances, and we all know what those are. And you know, but those those who want that information are going to find it anyway. I mean, Google search still exists, right? It's just a. It, it seems like people are worried more about the safety of the barred prompts than they are about the rest of search, uh, and, and that's what's getting it, all the heat right now. And it's going to limit the effectiveness of barred, uh, which again, that that's a that's the trade off, and and many of you may be fine with that that trade off, but it does seem like Google is spending a lot more time telling you what it's doing to stop the chatbot from saying anything possibly offensive. Uh, than it is telling you, oh, we've made it better. And even if it won't tell you how to make a Molotov cocktail, you can still find that on Google. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, um, also things that you can find on Google, I suppose. Uh, officially, Netflix has officially ended its DVD service. Pour out a little liquor, everybody. Netflix launched in 1998. 
And by the way, uh, with the company's uh, announcement of winding down DVD services, it reminded folks, Beetlejuice, the movie, the first title shipped. The company set a record in 2011 with 4.9 million DVDs shipped in a single day. In total, the company says it shipped 5 billion DVDs. Uh, this, this is a momentous day. The, uh, the I know, day. I know. You know, I, I mean, besides Roger Chang, I don't know who else cares I all that much. I got my but... last three discs the day before yesterday. <laughs> and you get to, and keep, you get to them, keep them, right? Those, right? Yeah. I get to keep them. I mean, they they will take, they will accept returns uh, until the end of if the next month. If you don't want to keep them. If, you if, if, these, if these small little <laughs> keepsakes are taking too much space, uh, in your home, but uh, you know, I've always wanted a copy. What'd you of get? Short What'd you get? You got to tell us the titles. Everybody I wants got, to know what I you know. got. I got shortcuts. On, Have you? Sh- I shortcuts. You know, Robert shortcut. Altman Russ movie. Altman. But, yes, uh, and, yes. And then I also I'm... got uh, volume one and two of the New Adventures of Batman: The Complete Series, which is oh. the 1960s hmm. animated Batman featuring uh, Ooh, good get. Yeah. Burt Ward. Uh, it's still doing nice. uh, ba- uh, Robin, but someone else doing Batman. Nailed it. Are you going to file those with your late blockbuster returns? I will file it under the other things I have in my room that I will probably forget in a month's time. <laughs> and if a Canadian says Quickster three times quickly, will we finally get the DVD by mail service here? Because we never had Netflix oh. by mail here. We had a copycat called Zip.ca, but we just got Netflix purely streaming. I mean, which was great. Although it was like a quarter or twenty percent of the of the catalog, back I don't know if they'll mail to Vancouver, but there's a, a video store in Seattle that's doing by mail now because Netflix is getting out of the business. So it might be worth looking into. You fill that gap, just like Red Red is Redbox still a thing? Yeah, there's one uh, my local grocery oh, store. I saw is. some guy standing yes. in front of a look, try, trying to pick a movie the other day. Amazing. Um, well, Tristan Jutra, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Whether you have DVDs or not, uh, we really, really appreciate having you with us. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. You can find our regular live streams at 7 p.m. Pacific time at Momentous.tv. And Tasia from Momentous and I started a little show thanks to the encouragement and support from all of y'all at DTNS. And that's called AI Named This Show. Which is, you know, we we aim for the dumbest possible name, but at least it's <laughs> at least it's memorable and it's got great SEO. So you can find us at AI Name This Show.com. And I'm at Tristan Jutra, and that's J-U-T-R-A-S on pretty much all the socials. Excellent. Uh, well, folks, it's the last day of free preview week. We do have a little something coming into your feeds tomorrow on Saturday. Uh, all this week, we were giving everyone access to the Good Day Internet Extended Show. I hope you've enjoyed that. If you did and you want to keep it coming, you can just become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash DTNS. And all of you all stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, so we're playing another round of Who Am I? Roger has researched great tech people in history, and we're going to try to guess who he picked one clue at a time. Come play along with us. Do so. Uh, Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back on Monday with Justin Robert Young joining us. Have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer, and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Gipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luders, Mustafa A, Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast adds support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Chris Ashley, Scott Johnson, and Chris Christensen. Our guest this week was Tristan Jutra. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible.
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Saray is in there saying, uh, I like to read the credits along with Tom on Fridays. Does anyone else do this? I kind of love that idea. It's a thing. I do. Everyone in the audience, I'm like, like in Tatiana unison. Tatiana Matias re- and <laughs> everyone. Yeah. I wonder if Tatiana knows just how many people know how to play. I, I find it very name. soothing. Yeah. To, yeah. Uh, to, that's awesome. To, to remind everybody <laughs> who who is part of this. You know, I mean, it takes a village, right? Maybe I'll I'll slip in like a little like fun nugget, like uh, snacks provided by Oscar Mayer. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> Margaritaville. Ah, uh, yes. Mm. <laughs> Libations provided, provided by mile. Margaritaville. Uh, oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> well. Your mileage may vary. Kombucha provided Otis, by. Well, folks, uh, if you want to submit a title, you should go do that right now because we are going to use your suggestions to name the show. Go to showbot.tv slash DTNS2 if you are watching or listening live in the Discord or on the Twitch. I have not properly prepared the theme music for our Friday fun time, so give me one second here. It's It's not... No, that's 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 not right. Yeah. Is it called that's Friday old. Fun Time? I don't know. It's I just okay made if it that is. up just now. I just that's you not, know that's not right either. Are you going to play it live, Tom? No, no, that's the wrong wrong you stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Tinkle the keys, tinkle the ivories. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's time <laughs> for something. I don't know what it's called. It's Friday. It's fun. It's time. I feel like I'm it's in bubble. Friday, bubble. yay, Tom. Okay. Indeed, indeed. And it is time for Who Am I? Roger has researched someone that we're going to try to guess. What? What's the matter? No, no, I'm Is it because because I researched it? it, No, just go ahead. Gosh. (laughs) Both of you. Uh, So I will give a clue, Tristan and Sarah. Y'all will try to guess who it is. Uh, if you don't guess on the first clue, that's totally normal. Uh, we'll just move on to another clue, but we only have 10 clues. So we want to try to guess who it is before clues, we get yes. to the 10. Oh, is it? Sarah, only I'll meet you at number eight. Yes. eight. We only have eight clues. We Thank you, Tristan. The difficulty at least level. someone yeah. understands me. All right, <laughs> let's do it. All right. Here's the first clue for our first person. Uh, they are written in first person voice. Uh, so the clue is. I designed an early form of hydrofoil, a boat with wings under the water that claimed the world marine speed record of 70.86 miles an hour in 1919. Jacques Cousteau. Oh, good guess. I have no guesses because the first thing that came to my mind was was Leonardo da Vinci, but that was a little after his time. Leonardo da Vinci, a little too old. Jacques Cousteau, probably too young for (laughs) 1919. That was like the kind of thing he would have come up with on paper. (laughs) Sure, yeah. It certainly was. All right, we'll go right to clue number two then. After the shooting of U.S. President Garfield in 1882, I was summoned... Twice, (laughs) he really hated that day. Uh, I was summoned twice to help locate the bullet lodged in his body using a form of metal detector I developed. And sadly, I was unsuccessful both times. (sighs) Don't know who did that. But I I salute you. Like person Edison that probably worked for the U.S. government. I salute you. We're Edison era. Here mm. for sure, yeah. Um, but it is not is Thomas. It Thomas Edison. Edison. Okay. No, it is um, not Thomas. Edison. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Now, if you've Tristan, seen, come on, come on. If you've, I'm he, only doing one guess per round here. So yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. If you've seen the made-for-TV movie about Helen Keller, maybe, maybe this will ring a bell. Uh, I helped connect Helen Keller with Anne Sullivan, Helen's tutor, who helped her write, speak, and read Braille. So think, think back. Who, what, what famous name from history that would have been alive in 1882 and 1919? Benjamin Franklin. 
<laughs> He's too old. He died in the 1700s. I but... don't know. I mean, okay. Uh, it's not Thomas Edison. But it's that era. Thomas Edison era, for sure. Uh, I don't know. Was there another guy that was, like, working with electricity at the time? Is it, well, it's not Tesla, is it? It's not Nikola Tesla, no. Okay. Pass. All right, all right. Yeah, pass. Clue four. The unit for sound measurement was named in my honor. Okay. Sarah, we, maybe we can do this one together. What's the unit? You, you, the unit for sound measurement. We should have it on our audio interfaces in I, front of I, us or something. I, I mean, this is this is a little. I'm I'm just gonna say, Roger, this one's a little bit deceptive okay. because okay, it's so, not one of the common sound measurements that you run into every day as a podcaster. Well, oh. then why? I'm just gonna give you a little. Oh, hit. like more maybe home theater yeah. theater. It's like decibel. Mm. In his honor, like deca is mm. tens or tenths mm. of. Dessa Bell. Oh, Tom, are you dropping hints in the clue for the previous? Dessa Bell. Sarah, can we do this? I th I don't think sure. Dessa Bell. Bell. Is there a Bell? Someone with a, a surname of Bell. AT and T. Anyone? Rogers. Coughing. Who Tom who is the telephone? looking at us weirdly. Or, like, what who, the heck is happening? <laughs> Watson, I need you to. Was it Al, uh, Alexander Graham Bell? Oh. Indeed. Indeed it was. Alexander. Tom was like ringing a bell on the last clue. Come on. Uh, oh, yeah. Alexander Graham Bell. You That's know, bell. now it makes sense. Is that even yep. really? Was it really named after his honor? Or is that just like a. Yes, retcon. I Bell think Park. it is. Tell us, really? tell yeah. us about it, Roger. Why? Yeah. Why? Oh. What are the details? Uh, so uh, it was named after <laughs> his death. So it wasn't when he was alive. Uh, to honor his contributions to acoustical science, uh, it's a standard unit for intensity of sound waves measured. Uh, in the 1920s, that's about one tenth of a bell. Is the most commonly used metric for measuring magnitude of noise. There you go. And it's like logarithmic or something, too. I'm always confused by dBs. Sound and like, is, why in your stereo is it negative yeah, dBs? Sound is like, logarithmic. What? Volume is yeah. logarithmic. Yes, volume is logarithmic. Yeah. We need Patrick and I don't know if it's decibels it. or if it's volume units, though. I was DBs. thinking about that the other day where I'm like, why is it that like a negative two is the right? Um, oh, that's because yeah. it's uh, it's a different, f it's, 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 it's the same measurement, but you're measuring. There's a term for it, and I totally spacing on it. Um, but there's and a I reason get why. That. Because and I can work with that. But I'm like, yeah. why is it not just zero? Oh, that's because like, zero is where water to... freezes at sea level, right? Well, I mean, <laughs> yes, it's the right. same reason why. Probably, like, it... yeah. On the Belsius scale, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, I see what you did there. Uh, the other clues were uh, he created the first wireless telephone using light waves. Um, of course, you need to have a direct line of sight. Uh, we've, we've already. We, How many birds did it take out? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, after his death in the U.S. and Canada, uh, f telephones were silent for one minute as his body was being lowered into the grave. What does so that mean? That, the telephones were silent. Like if you made a so call, it wouldn't all ring. All the, all the that... switch operators wouldn't switch anyone over from one to a call. Ah, okay. So, so they, they just like sat there, stood down the sat... entire telephone network for a yeah. minute. Uh, Lily Tomlin took a beat. And then uh, the other one I, I threw in here because of you, Tristan. I said because of my. And that was in 1922. Sorry, I think yeah. it was important to note when that was that he died. It was 1922, so only three years after he set that hydrofoil record. Mm. Yeah, he was he was still cranking mm. on Industrious. those. Industrious. Um, clue number five was uh, because of his significant accomplishments. He's been claimed both by Canadian and Americans alike as one of their. Ah. We'll I mean, form. probably the problem is it's not really a problem. Is the situation is he worked on the telephone both in Boston and back in Canada, and he kind of frequently went back and forth. So it was more like, you know, was he Canadian? I, was he born? He was a in Canadian Canada, citizen. I mean? He was. He was, also, he was Scottish. He was a Scottish. So he was born citizen. in Scotland. Yes. Well, the Scots should claim him too. Then probably yes, do. they do. Yeah. Very, Everyone very Logan that's... Roy. Hmm. Yeah. 
Or Ted Cruz. The last clue was a large monopolistic American telco was named after me. <laughs> That's the, that clue eight is, is like, let me just try to give you everything as much as I can without naming the person. Okay, okay, next one. Come on. Yes, next one. Okay, this this one is, is a literary figure. I'm just going to say that because we, we were thinking technology. So I, I want to... Uh, Roger, is there a particular reason you chose this yes. person? Yes. Uh, the... Us. The clue in uh, the clue, the third clue. Third clue. Okay. Uh, clue number one, though. In World War II, I was a fighter pilot for the RAF, flying the last biplanes used by the service. And after a crash in North Africa, I flew Hawker Hurricanes and participated in the Battle of Athens. John McCain. <laughs> You know what? I think this person is probably like actually no, uh, relatively close to John there. McCain's age. Uh, but okay. no, it was not. Right. It was not John it's McCain. Not I was like, just thinking. Like Lindbergh I'm, or someone I'm like thinking. that. More, yeah. even more literary than John McCain. Okay. Oh, yes, it's, it's a literary character, right? Yeah. So it's not a real person. No, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a real, real person. person. Oh, okay. Just, but in the, the literary world. For sure. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, pay okay. All right. Next clue. clue. Two. Keep it moving. <laughs> Due to injuries from combat, I was made an air attache and assigned to the diplomatic post in Washington, D.C. During my time there, I was recruited by the MI6 to spy on the United States and help Churchill get along with President Roosevelt. Oh, gosh. Ian Fleming. It's very Ian Fleming sounding, isn't it? It is not. Good guess, though. Literary figure fits the profile. But no, it is not Ian Fleming. There's some Ian Fleming news we should talk about later. But oh, yeah? I thought he was gone. I can't, <laughs> He's back, I can't think He's of back. who this would they be. Brought him back. Uh, all right, clue number three. After my son was left with hydrocephalus or water on the brain after a car accident, I teamed up with a pediatric neurosurgeon and a toy maker slash hydraulic engineer. Joe Biden. To <laughs> so close. To develop a cerebral old. shunt valve to drain the fluid. The valve was put into production in 1962 and has been used to treat 3,000 children worldwide. Oh, my goodness. Literary spy figure who worked on developing a pediatric, a cerebral shunt valve. None of these are Angelina obvious. Jolie. I was yeah, say. And that's correct. It Share in math. I wish it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's the first clue that might actually help you get it. All right. <laughs> Unless you already All do right. this. No more Hunter and no, clues. Come, come on. on. Yeah. Come on. You know. Clue number three is just us. justifying what the technology aspect of this person. Clue number four. My time in the RAF inspired me to write my first book, which Disney commissioned a movie for. But it was never made. Walt Disney. The move. Oh, oh no! I, I think Disney made lots of Walt's movies. <laughs> so this is a this is an I author. I just don't know. I don't know okay, the answer. The, I'm trying to help you out here, Sarah. It's not like Dr. I know. Seuss. I know. I know. Okay. So work for Disney. Dr. So Seuss is not didn't super work literary. for Disney, yeah. but his book was commissioned to become a Disney movie. So that tells you a little bit about what kinds of stuff. Disney the adjacent. Wrote. Yeah. That's what yeah. I meant. Um, yeah. Is it? Does oh. not Chuck Yeager. I'm sorry. I usually don't uh, look at the chat. So a clue is RAF. No, so he's Chuck British. Did we get to that he's before? British. Yeah. Yeah. We we knew he spied for the MI6. Right. 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 But this confirms RAF. Yeah. I thought MI6 was like just anyway. Make believe. Uh, different conversation. It's MI7. I don't know. Um. I don't know. I don't Clue know. Number five. Tristan? I married in a. I shot my shot. I said no. Dr. C, so I'm pretty sure that's not it. No, <laughs> I it's think not he was Dr. British. No. Clue number five I married an American actress and had five kids, one of whom served as a consultant on screen adaptation of a book I wrote. This is not Joe Biden. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know. Um... It sounds just like him. <laughs> Okay, who did that? My son, Bo. <laughs> no? Okay, you know what? That's not funny. Uh, you okay. brought it up. Um, 
Uh, I don't know. I could have brought up know. Hunter. That would have been worse. I give up. Clue number six. Okay. Although right. I'm known right. primarily, although I'm known primarily for my children's stories, I also had a parallel career writing adult macabre stories. One of these oh, stories ah, was adapted ah. three times for a TV and once as a movie. Shell Silverstein. No, but that's very close. What? You are oh, so in the right I ballpark. I was right. Who, who is exactly like Shell Silverstein, but isn't Shell Silverstein, is what you need to be thinking. Hmm. Is, it, is it someone who is being um, posthumously canceled? No. Is it no, no. Roll Doll? It is, in fact, Roald Is he Dahl. being canceled? Well, he's got some dark stuff. Well, there's some problematic stuff in there. Isn't that they're oh. trying to go back and edit, re-edit some of his? Yeah, they, 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 they actually, yeah. that that's the story I heard, is that they went <sighs> back and, and are, are publishing Roald Dahl's older stories with edits that, that make mm. them more palatable to the modern sensibility. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, do we have another one? Come on. I want to do it. All right. Anything, anything about Roald Dahl that you want to, to, that we didn't get to, Roger? That Love is was just uh, too he, was a, he was, a, he was a pilot. He was a spy, and he was a children's author. All right. Wrote and Charlie and the Chocolate. One good oh, movie also, from his work, and an that's event. it. <laughs> Fantastic Mr. Fox, James and the Giant Peach, Fair. Charlie and the Chocolate. James and the Giant Peach. You know. Uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox, I'll give you, but James and the Giant Peach. I was like, a lot of it was. Was Tim Burton involved in that one too? Like, oh, I, he was I involved like, in one. Uh, I feel like Tim Burton is like has been yeah. channeling Roald Dahl for decades. Mm, maybe. I don't know this person. That's the third person. Uh, great. <laughs> Sarah, I thought of it because. Come on, come on, Tristan. Everybody's Let's very look alive here. So I thought maybe it'd be a yeah. Thing. Maybe, right. maybe maybe it's just me. Clue number one, my mother was one of the first women in Guatemala to complete medical school and had me at age 42, despite being single. Pass. In what year? I mean, that's not a good, okay, keep going. All right. My gateway to technology and science was a Commodore 64 computer my mother bought me when I was eight years old. Is it me? I was going to say, is it me? <laughs> it's oh, me. I was it's later. all of us. It's all three of us. <laughs> I was a Vic 20 when I was 10, so close. Oh, that's like, I just sounds okay. very familiar. Okay. <laughs> I so a contemporary of ours. Yeah. Okay. This this is a very contemporary technology person. I just looked them up. Uh, number three, I was listed in Fast Company's 100 Most Innovative People in Business. When? Doesn't say. <laughs> <laughs> was it because Fast Company in the 90s was, he was a bit different eight, than Fast Company It was eight now. when he got a Commodore 64. So, right. that, that gives so it's a, a man. Idea. It's a he. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, Wheel? Um, let's just say Satya Nadella. No. I received a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics from Duke University, a PhD in Computer Science from Carnegie Mellon, and became cool. a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon in 2006. There are Duke people. Oh, Duke people no. are kind of weird. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they're like Duke people. Um, who is what that Get ready for comments. Mean? Duke people are kind of weird. Sarah Lane. No, they are. They know they are. <laughs> yeah. They're They'll just even like, agree. Mm -hmm. They're that weird. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> they're Duke centric when I say right. weird. Okay. Know, so they, this is an innovative tech person okay, from yeah. Duke and taught at Carnegie Mellon or possibly still teaches at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Because yeah, at first I was thinking like Andreessen, but he doesn't teach and it's the wrong, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the wrong, yeah. Clue number five, I had to spend $1,200 to fly to El Salvador to take my TOEFL test of English as a foreign language when I was applying to universities in the U.S. Oh, hence the Guatemala okay. background. I mm -hmm. forgot about that. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um... <clears throat> Hmm, who would that be? All right, here's the first clue that will help you narrow down the arena in which this person is. I still would never have gotten this person's name, but at least I might have started to know, oh, maybe they mean this person. Hmm. I helped coin the term CAPTCHA along with Manuel Blum, Nicholas J. Hopper, and John Lankford. We all know those guys, right, Sarah? <laughs> 
Hundred percent. Roger's I'm punking just, us. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Just, <laughs> I don't know. Um, this is a fairly obscure. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know the company this person runs better Lindy than Ocarina. ever know this person. Well, no, but you know her name. Oh, we, haven't talked about, we haven't talked I'm, about I'm, Linda. I'm I will accept silly. like, oh, is it the person who runs this company as a correct answer is what I'm saying. Because I, I don't think you would ever know the person's name. <clears throat> um, Would it With be? A... I don't know. Tristan, help. Someone with a cosmopolitan background international and it's not, it's not, <laughs> well, not economy. Economy. that's the wrong continent now that i've said that clue eight is basically just going to become irrelevant but uh clue just seven give it to us clue seven <laughs> i invented recaptcha a new form of captcha that also helps digitize books okay roger you think we wouldn't get it on captcha but we would somehow get it on recaptcha are you kidding yeah <laughs> Oh, the recapture. Oh, the recapture lady. I oh, right. you say so. <laughs> yeah. I want to I want to talk to the guy who is making us click on crosswalks and bicycles. I'm sorry. I want to add I'll, I'll add on to clue 7. Oh, I know. By the way, Acast with the now you log into Acast, it's like you have to click on motorcycles every day. It's ridiculous. <sighs> um I will add to clue 7. Uh this person used what they learned at in 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 researching captcha to inform the product of the company they are now a part of in other words that idea of having users answer questions and then taking that data to improve the product in which they that they are using that sounds like reinforcement learning with know. humans yeah, involved yeah like who's the ceo of lastpass I, you know i i don't know I don't know. And it's not. All right. It's not someone, one of the AI companies. I'm going to rephrase Clue 8, Roger, All in right. order to uh, keep to my earlier keep, stipulation. Keep, keep us from, you know, crying. Okay. Here's Clue 8. Does, or is a question for Clue 8. Does, did Roger actually know who this was? Yeah, Roger, did you know this person when you made this? No. Okay. Okay. It's Clue a eight. learning experience for hook. everyone. We can clue eight. Everyone learn. That's the whole point. I, anyway, clue, okay, go. Clue eight. I co-founded a language translation app company with my <clears throat> graduate student Severin Hacker, and I am also the company's CEO. Sam Alban. Language translation company. I co-founded a language translation app with my oh. graduate student Severin Hacker. My Who dad's runs? They just start naming language apps. Yeah, yeah. Good. Do um. Who? <laughs> I don't know. Don't, think, don't worry. I you don't well, have to name the person. It's not like Rosetta Never Stone. name the person. Just name it's apps. Not it's not uh, Mavis Beacon teaches typing. It's not Rosetta it's, Stone. No, it's um. I get um. Have, hold you on. Have on your phone, Sarah. Calm are you, down. Are you learning Spanish? Duolingo. <laughs> Ding. Correct. Louis Von Ahn. I actually had to look at my oh, phone to Louis. remember the name of that. Yeah. Louis. 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 He's not Louis. French. Louis. Louis Von Ahn. My dad loves well, Duolingo. Well, uh, thanks, Roger, for throwing us under that big old bus. Well, now uh, you now know who know. co-founded yeah. and runs Duolingo. Also <laughs> helped put together the CAPTCHA systems we now use and came up with a better <laughs> CAPTCHA system. I got, uh, I got news for you, Roger. We already forgot. <laughs> <laughs> What's his name again? Luis? Luis, Luis von Ahn. Von Ahn. Lu oh, is Luis. there some German in there too? Is he? Yeah. He's, There's uh, a lot of Germans get... down in Latin America. Yeah. <laughs> should we, should we for explore For better that and further? worse. <laughs> nope. Turns out. Yeah. All right. Do we, Let's uh, not all Germans. Do just, that. Just leave it at that. Not all. No. Hey, his, 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 about, his family is most. of is is of Jewish descent. Just, oh wow. Okay. Go. Different reason. Um, there is. I don't know if you guys have much left. I know we don't have tons of time left, but there is a couple of other interesting a, adjacent stories to that whole uh, robots.txt thing. That um, one of which it was a story that I <laughs> thought I had sent Roger very late last night and turns out I never actually sent him the link. And that was that, um, that it was like open AI is going to be playing ball with people who don't want the, them to, 
to scan this. And you may, you may have covered it. Uh, we alluded to it that OpenAI yeah. is also honoring this. And I know a bunch of sites like New York Times have already blocked OpenAI's oh, yeah. bots. They're like, yeah. no thanks. And now, the thing is, it's like with a lot of these, like the big search engines will, will follow the rules because they don't want to run afoul of the terms of service. But there's lots of rogue crawlers out there. They don't care anyway. They'll just ignore robots.txt. And they can go and they can go and train their malignant LLMs. So that's a thing. But I thought one of the other things I thought was a bit more interesting was there was another um did you hear about Google was someone found out that Google was sharing uh, was indexing barred chats that you had shared with other people. So if you did like a, a you know, you're using Bard for something, kind of like you can do in Bing Chat, whatever. Yeah, and I then there's that shit. You guys, do you guys talk about it already? I don't know if we talked about it on the show or not now that I can't remember it. But yeah, it was like the 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 Kerberos, the snake that eats itself, basically. Yeah. And then so you could go and like search stuff if you if you use the the prompt um uh that sorry, in the in just in Google proper, just limited it to the certain um domain, which was like what Bard dot google.com or whatever because you can do like um, domain specific searches and so google jumped on that and and killed it right away so you couldn't search for that subdomain but it still works on bing so oh, if you, yeah. so if you go to bing and search that you can actually go and see like queries that people have thrown at bard and it's still all public so google just flipped the switch but it wasn't a very good switch so <laughs> interesting be careful yeah. what you're putting into bard because if you've ever shared it with any <laughs> any single person it, it's it's been indexed by google and could be yeah and a lot of, a lot of what you're putting in a prompt yeah. doesn't matter if it's, it gets out there public but part of it's the principle and part of it is uh if you are creating a prompt that has personal information on it you may not want that out on on the internet right how many people are being very careful though yeah, if, especially because people aren't aware that that's a, a possible yeah. implication of what they're what they're putting in there. Just never assume what you're doing on the internet is private unless you're really sure it's private. is a, is a good policy overall as a user. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, well, thank you to the folks who make this possible. I hope you've enjoyed free preview week. Like I said, if you have, please head over to Patreon.com/slash/DTNS. Uh, we like to thank everybody who gives us support in all kinds of ways, including uh, folks who give us a raise. Uh, Tom, not me, different Tom, Jim and John all raised their pledges. Uh, thank you, Tom, Jim and John and every single one of our patrons. Also, a big uh, thank you to the folks who support us on Twitch. That's how we were able to have a video. Kitherell gave us a follow. Paley Glendale gave us bits. Lint Monkey uh, gave us a follow. Zoe Brings Bacon gave us bits. S Dub Texas cheered us with bits and resubscribed for the 29th month. Thank you, S Dub. Uh, GPEG84 resubscribed to tier one for the 44th month. And we also got files, follows from Ryan in Minneapolis and Density524. Thank you again, Tristan. It was great hanging out with you, man. Thanks for having me again. It was good to be back. Until tomorrow, everyone, have a good day. Have a good day. And a great weekend. Have a good day.